I have always been fascinated by the ocean. Throughout this expedition, our divers have shared the sea with extraordinary but often little-known fish, corals, plants and animals. But for me, the most mythical and deeply touching inhabitants of the deep are whales. The team has headed to the Silver Bank, off the coast of the Dominican Republic, in the Caribbean Sea. Every year in winter, humpback whales return to this protected shoal to breed and give birth. It's a magnificent place where one can slip into the whale's environment and share their world. There are few places on the planet like this where we can draw back the curtain on their lives. By spending time with these whales, we can better understand them and ultimately better protect them. There are few places where humans can share the underwater world of the last giants on Earth. But access to the Silver Bank Sanctuary is strictly controlled. Only three boats have permits to observe humpback whales during the breeding and calving season. The crew has left the Sedna Four to join the Sun Dancer, a ship that has plied these waters for many years. It takes about 12 hours to reach the sanctuary. For this expedition, two leading experts on whales have joined mission leader Jean Lemire. Richard Sears, who travels the world to study whales, and Sal Sergio, who began his career as a biologist on Silver Bank. After nearly 30 years, Sal and Richard are back on Silver Bank with the same passion and desire to study whales. The idea of coming here back then was to gather all the scientists from the Northeast who were working on humpback whales, from the St. Lawrence to Newfoundland and Labrador to New England, together on Silver Bank. When I found out about it, I was naturally thrilled to take part and come observe where these whales go in the winter. It was the first time that we really focused on photo identification of humpback flukes to find out where all the whales on Silver Bank were coming from. I was here 28 years ago, and when the opportunity to come back to Silver Bank arose, there was no way I could resist. On that trip, it just so happened that there were several major scientists that were currently doing work with humpback whales. So I got quite lucky to be involved in a project of that level. And you know, I was you know, on the breeding grounds of humpback whales in the North Atlantic, one of the most densest aggregations on the planet. Scientists like to go where the whales are abundant. Doing research far at sea is extremely difficult, so where there are a lot of whales, you'll often find an abundance of scientists too. Jean and Richard are old research colleagues. From the Sea of Cortez to Iceland to the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada, they have worked together to photograph different species of whales around the world. Photography is the basis of whale research. Patterns of skin pigmentation are unique to each animal, which allows them to be recognized and told apart. This is essential for studying their behavior. This is an example of a humpback photo ID. It's like a fingerprint. They are kind enough to lift their fluke when they dive, and the pattern on the underside of the tail is unique for each animal. It can vary from completely black to completely white. We learn about the species by studying individuals, 
and there are now huge photo ID catalogs of humpback populations around the world. Now that the catalogs have been digitized, when we get to a place where someone has taken pictures of humpbacks, we can attempt to find a match and identify the individual using a simple computer or even an iPad. Photo identification has helped pinpoint the main gathering sites of humpbacks around the world. The discovery of Silver Bank, the humpback's main breeding site in the Atlantic, is a result of this collaboration between different research teams. In the Pacific, humpbacks gather around the Hawaiian Islands in winter to breed and give birth. When I was much younger, I had the privilege of working in Hawaii for several winters. I had a scientific permit to swim with the whales and study their behavior during the breeding season. It was fascinating work. This underwater world is so foreign to us. We know so little about it, but we think that the whale's reproductive strategy revolves around the females. Males are often aggressive toward each other, and we sometimes witness intense combats to win the favors of a female. The male closest to the female is called the escort. He is constantly confronted by other males called challengers. They want to get close to the female to mate with her. This can lead to violent combats. But this is all hypothesis. No one has ever witnessed humpback whales mating. The same goes for calving. We do not yet have convincing visual proof. I remember one day, I filmed the erect penis of a male approaching a female. The footage has become popular because it's not something you see every day. But spectacular as it was, it didn't prove a thing. It's all hypothesis. There are clues, but in science, you need irrefutable proof. There were situations where we were surrounded by 10 or 15 males fighting amongst each other, and it was tense at times. But they are among the most memorable moments of my career. In recent decades, scientists have made their most important scientific discoveries about whales at winter gathering areas like the Dominican Republic. The seasonal gatherings of humpbacks on breeding grounds give scientists a chance to accumulate a large amount of data on the various subpopulations. It's marvelous to monitor a group over a long distance on Silver Bank. I couldn't have imagined it any better when Jean spoke to me about returning here. It's amazing to watch this group of active males on the surface. That's a baby breed. The clear water at Silver Bank lets scientists share the whale's underwater world. This protected shoal is shallow, making it easier to observe and study whale behavior throughout the water column. Mothers and calves are much calmer than males, who often engage in combat. They don't move around much, allowing biologists to observe the interactions between mother and calf. Wow. Yeah, 
Now, did you see the way the calf was let go by the mother? Yeah. She just came right up to the surface. She stayed down there and then she oh, came up. It was nice. Amazing. Calves are often reckless. In a spirit of mutual curiosity, the mother allows the scientists and her offspring to interact. You're not scared. These are what I call little moments of eternity. They get etched into your memory forever. It was fantastic. I've never had an experience like that before. Oh. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> She just came up and breezed through there without touching any of us. I would have touched her pectorals and I would have had it. The mother allowed her curious calf to approach us. It was no more than three months old. The mother was calm and watchful. If the calf came too close, she would just come over and turn. And we were sort of trapped between the calf and the mother. Daniela wound up right over the mother's back, but she didn't move. And it was the mother who moved off. Not far, maybe a hundred feet, and then returned to the bottom. The calf moved under the mother. Really, it was the perfect situation. In our experience working in Mexico, the whales aren't as curious and they're not as tolerant. So we can approach them in the boat, but they don't come over and, and check us out and go under the boat and look at us and approach us more in the water. That was completely new. Yeah. No, it was fantastic. Whole, I mean, it, and also it was so long. I mean, sometimes you get in with whales and it, you get a nice gift for five minutes, ten minutes, but this went on for hours and we'd get out and this time we were able to stay in a good long amount of time. It's been really, been a really nice moments. Incredible. With encounters like that, you can die happy tomorrow. Incredible. It's the very end of the season, so there are a lot of very active males in large groups. We want to study the relationship between the escort 
and the challengers. The escort is the male closest to the female, and all the other males fight to get as close to the female as possible. Amidst all this action are a few isolated males who decide to sing. We'll put the hydrophone in the water and hear many singers, because the songs carry well in the water. But the hard part is isolating one. It's challenging, but we probably have the best people on board for it, so with a bit of luck, we'll be successful. Right now we're searching for a singer. It's kind of like looking for a needle in a haystack. And what we want to do is keep moving, listening each time we move, to look for um, a single individual singer to get louder and louder. And once it gets louder from one stop to another, we know we're moving in the right direction and then we can start to look for him on the surface. Finding a lone male singer among groups of humpback whales is a real challenge. Scientists must identify certain parts of the song, long prolonged growls, that mean the male is about to surface. They then scan the horizon for the whale's spout on the surface and try to approach the male slowly to avoid any kind of disturbance. When you find your singer, you're ecstatic. When you slip into the water with him, the song is so powerful that your internal organs vibrate. It's hard to describe. It's simply extraordinary. Just like human songs, humpback whale songs are organized into verses and refrains. The song changes over the course of a year, but the amazing thing is that at some point, all the males end up singing the same song. We don't understand exactly how this happens, but it's extraordinary. And what's even more incredible, listen to what happens if we speed up the song. Here, we've sped it up 14 times. Listen. It's very much like the structure of bird song in its complexity. It's just that humpback whales sing very, very slowly. It's fascinating. Song in the humpback whale is a major part of a breeding system and the role it plays in the breeding system. So it attracts a lot of attention because of the emotional attachment that people have with song. And that's both on the level of what we as humans come to uh, what song is all about. Song is an incredible uh, aspect of every single culture. It's a very important aspect of every single culture on the planet. This song changes throughout the breeding season. In spring, when the whales begin their long migration north, the males stop singing. The singing of males is often associated with courtship, a sort of seductive serenade to attract females. But this is just a theory. Despite significant advances in the understanding of whale behavior, the exact function of the humpback song remains a mystery. At any given time, all males in a group sing essentially the same or very similar songs. They 
change the song over time. Um, it's a gradual and progressive change. And all whales within a group change their song in the same ways. So they're learning from each other. Um, and the, the last remarkable aspect of it is that within an ocean basin, animals that have contact at some point in time are sharing those songs and sharing those changes and changing in the same way. Scientists still do not understand how males share the same song. They also wonder how the song is transmitted over long distances, well beyond the hearing range of a single group gathered in the same area. But beyond science, the incredible emotion produced when you experience this unique phenomenon is perhaps its greatest mystery. With the arrival of spring begins the long migration north. After fasting during the breeding season, it is time for the whales to head to the rich waters of the northern latitudes. Photo identification and satellite tags have identified different feeding sites in the Atlantic, ranging from the coast of New England up to Iceland and even Norway. In the Pacific, humpback whales migrate too. They leave the breeding area of Hawaii and head to Alaska to feed. Some whales in this area of the Pacific have developed a truly special feeding technique. Rather than feed alone, some humpbacks form groups to capture their prey. The herring that school in the rich waters of Alaska in summer. These whales have developed a shrill feeding call, which they use to synchronize their assault on schools of fish. They also use bubbles expelled from their blowholes to create a sort of net. The feeding call frightens the herring, while the bubble net herds them together. The work of biologist Fred Sharp has helped to understand this truly unique fishing technique, one used only by a small number of humpback whales. I worked with Fred Sharp here in Alaska a long time ago. I think it was 1996. We were trying to film everything on the surface to understand what was going on. At the same time, we had hydrophones in the water to try to understand who was doing what in the groups. Later, this work formed the basis for many well-known studies. I arrived in Alaska in 1987, and I came up as a naturalist and uh, saw my first bubble net and never looked back. I guess the most important thing I've learned about these humpback whales is that they're all incredible individuals. Each one seems to have its own story. It's a story that may last up to a century. They have their own ways of feeding. They have their own friends, their own places, their own places they call home. And that's been the most wonderful part is just learning the tremendous lives of these whales. The humpback whale in Southeast Alaska is truly one of our most abundant and amazing backyard predators. Almost all of them are from Polynesia, uh, the Hawaiian Islands and they come up here in May and they'll spend six to eight months feeding on herring and krill. And then around Christmas time, they head back to the islands of Hawaii and complete their amazing life cycle. Right there, oh, yeah. right there. Hold this position. Captain, should we move a little bit to have the photo ID of this one? That's yeah. no, just phenomenal. He's gonna die. There he goes. Great. Hello. The idea is to be as perpendicular to the fluke as possible. Each fluke has a distinctive pigmentation pattern that allows us to photo ID the animals. It is important to be able to identify individual whales because if we want to study their behavior, we have to be able to tell the individuals apart. 
All body marks are important, so we try to take a lateral photograph of the dorsal fin and then one of the fluke. That way, we can be sure that we get the ID right. And if we're ever in shallow water and the whales don't show their tails, we also have the dorsal fin as a reference. How many animals do you have in your catalog? About 1,000. 1,000? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, pretty big. Uh, Jan's got about 2,000 in the park. There's probably about 3,000, 3,500 animals for the northern southeast Alaska. A few Guadalajarans come up, a few Mexicans. A um, few Asiatics show up once in a while, but... Mainly Hawaii. Hawaii? Yeah, almost all Hawaiian. Bubbles. Bubbles. Right, right here. here. See that nice softball side? Yeah. <laughs> and the classic. Now those are the ones that really scare the fish the most. Bigger, faster, they reflect more light. Um, they make a lot more noise. Those are the real workhorse of the bubble net. But, um, and it looks like, looks like this one, Adam, looks like it might be going in a counterclockwise circle. That's kind of interesting. About 90% of the animals blow in a clockwise circle. Oh, yeah. And it's remarkable in that it's the same level of handedness or laterality that humans have. So it's another striking similarity between humpback whales and humans. Hmm. Here we are, bare enough, warm spring, so um, what's the plan, Fred? Well, I figure um, we're going to have a lot of fog this morning, so what do you think, Cap? you feel comfortable navigating in these fogs? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is not a problem. It's supposed to burn off by midday, uh, and it's actually, I think it, I think it already is starting to burn off a little bit. So I figure um, good time for running north, and uh, hopefully things will burn off by the time we get up to the confluence of Peril Strait and Chatham, and that's uh, so why we probably got three, four hours get up there. When we uh, arrived by plane, <coughs> we saw a you know, good group of whales around Parker Point. Right. So, you know, it's close to Angoon. So. Yeah. Typically, there's a lot of herring schools still in this area at this time of the year, and it's been kind of an unusual year. It seems like the herring has sort of picked up and moved out of Dodge, and so in some ways we're looking for the prey as much as we are the whales. We have the weather on our side, so let's Yeah, move. we do. The humpbacks feed in a remarkable variety of ways. And the krill, these small shrimp-like crustaceans, they're quite easy for the whales to catch, and so most of the time when they're feeding on the krill, they can do it alone. Typically, they hunt the krill by just swimming up to a school and opening their mouth and engulfing them. They'll laterally lunge, they'll roll to the surface, they will um, lunge up through them, um, but they will use a whole variety of techniques. Amazing. And there's whales everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> Hey, he's, he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah. That was great. Amazing. So that's your friend. 
Beautiful animal. You know, it's funny that he is so friendly. Did you see on his tail he had where he had ropes or he'd been in nets before? Yeah. yeah. He has been insulted by humanity, but yet he comes over to be to be curious and interactive. It's amazing. It's almost like forgiveness. Yeah. It's wow. On such a beautiful evening too. Yeah. Perfect. There's his footprint. Yeah. What do you suppose? He just curious? He just Just curious. Just yeah. wanted to know who we are and what's up yeah. and we are with a very curious whale, one that keeps passing right under our boat. And what's amazing is that it comes very close and then turns slightly to look at us. It's done this three or four times. And see, again, instead of chasing the whale, yeah, yeah, you exactly. just wait yeah. and you're a target. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Couldn't have said it better, Massan. Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> going under, going under. Hello, hello. Thanks for coming back. It's gonna be near you, Captain. Thanks for the fluke ID. Yeah. Nice. Amazing. 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 Yeah, coming, coming right here, right here. He's rolling over. Rolling, rolling. Woo, 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 woo. Wow. Yeah. They know exactly what they're doing. They swim around the boat and turn to look at us. This one rolled right on its side to really get a good look at us. It's hard to know why they do it, but one thing is sure. It's very much a conscious act. You know, I've just been so incredibly curious about them for, you know, a quarter of a century, and it's nice to finally think they want to know a little bit about us. It's really touching, and it's really, um, it's kind of a gift. Yeah. And they, they share so many similarities with humans. Their brain is just gigantic, and it's laced with spindle neurons, and in humans, those are associated with language acquisition, social intelligence, and compassion. And we see a lot of compassionate acts with humpback whales, the way they'll protect their young if there's predators around, and they'll come to each other's aid, and um, just general interspecies interest that's a sense of higher, higher cognitive function. Yeah. The weather has taken a turn for the worse, so it will be harder to work now. Today, we hope that the whales we saw yesterday, individually using bubbles to feed down deep, will come together at the surface so we can observe them using this technique as a group when the attacks are synchronized with song. It's truly spectacular. Calling the Washington State Ferry Fairweather. This is the Wayfinder, do you copy 1 6? This is the State Ferry Fairweather, WDB 5604, back to the call. Okay, Fairweather. We kindly wanted to inquire about any number of cetaceans, particularly humpback whales, that you might have seen in your journey through Peril Strait. Over. At 11.03, we saw them bubble net feeding just inside uh, between Pavarotny and Light 22. And at 14.30, we spotted a couple of whales, but there wasn't a lot of bird activity, and we didn't see any bubble feeding on our way, you know, this direction. Well, thank you so much, and kindly, if you, in your further journeys, come across any more significant numbers of bubble net feeding humpback whales, we'd really appreciate uh, to hear from you. Roger. The people of Alaska know whales and their behavior. This is an asset for Fred Sharp who must travel great distances to find the whales that use this particular feeding technique. 
The observations received from the ferry now guide the boat to a small, isolated inlet. These whales are hungry, and they're looking for food. They're cruising the strip. They're looking to mix it up. They um, need about half a ton of food a day, and humpbacks have this large trick-or-treat bag made out of spandex on their tummy, and they feed by engulfing big, big chunks out of the ecosystem every time they feed. It's almost uh, night. They normally, you know, slow down at yeah, this time yeah. of the day, right? Well, this is very typical about this time of the evening. The whales, um, the rate with which they're feeding slows down. They seem to lose the beat on the herring. The fish are more scattered out, and they move out to mid-channel where they can get their sea room and have uh, plenty of space, an ocean moorage, yeah. and they go to sleep. And they get a good night's sleep, so they're ready to get at it in the morning. <laughs> Before night sets in, Fred and Jean have photo ID'd a small group of feeding whales. This is standard procedure, almost a reflex for researchers who use cameras as a primary research tool. But that night, an examination of the photographs reveals something unexpected. A wonderful surprise that also demonstrates the effectiveness of photo identification. An old friend has reappeared. Uh, I think that might be Trumpeter. Yeah, we found him. <laughs> that, and great news, tr if it's Trumpeter, I mean, yeah. we know that's a good leader. Yeah. Very good leader. Trumpeter and Jan are big old friends. Yes. They go way back. Yeah, oh, yeah. Remember back in 1996? Yeah. Here's our friend Trumpeter. Yeah. And you can compare it to what we obtain on this voyage. And oh, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, that's a match. Look, that little thing here, same pigmentation pattern. Nice serrated trailing edge. And here's why we call him Trumpeter. The most amazing sounds. Makes the most brilliant low. It starts out with this nice low, um, steady, and then he just goes off the scale. It's like you're saying, Miles Davis. <laughs> In the morning, Trumpeter, the humpback whale first identified in 1996, was waiting for them. Nice. Trumpeter again. Yep, you were right. That's him, right? Yeah, that's amazing. God, it's like... In 96, Trumpeter was leading a big group and he was really, you know, yeah. active and he was the one who was uh, start, starting the feeding call, yep. doing the bubbles and everything, yep. and always going very high compared yeah, to yeah, the other, yeah. right in the middle. You know, he, he disappeared from the database for like seven years and we thought he'd gone to the great bubble net in the sky, and but he's back and leading team bubble net. That should be plenty deep. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, nice and loud. The feeding calls that the humpbacks produce appear to be unique here in Southeast Alaska. Um, everywhere you go, it seems like they have their special nuances, but here in Alaska, we're richly rewarded by these loud, beautiful feeding calls, larger groups with more stable, enduring friendships. Oh, nice feeding call. 
clear, pure. I mean, it, it hurts my ears. I sit in the lab and listen to this hour after hour, and it's like, after a while, it's like, this is crazy. Do they start the feeding called first and the bubble after, or? Seems to be a lot of variation there. Yeah, a lot of individual style, but uh, typically we'll uh, hear the bubbles and the feeding call start about the same time. Oh, now you can hear the bubbles coming up. You hear that? Deploying the bubble net, percolating it out of the, out of the blowhole as far as we know. These Alaskan whales have developed a unique feeding technique in which whales cooperate to capture prey. After more than 15 years, scientists have concluded that Trumpeter is still a leader among the whales, often sounding the charge and commanding the troops. Those sounds that you're hearing, those are the whales diving below the herring schools and producing these incredibly loud, annoying sounds. It's almost like turning a fire alarm on a building and all you want to do is run for the exits. Well, that's what the whales are doing. And one whale going in usually a clockwise fashion and the bubbles rise up and effervesce and create this amazing corral. It's almost like a, it's almost like a rocket tube that the whales then come shooting up and engulf the prey at the surface. The increase of humpback whales, both here in the Pacific and throughout the world, is one of the best conservation success stories. And it's, it's remarkable to see how humans can, you know, exhibit concern for the environment and then show some conservation wisdom. And we're richly rewarded to see the humpbacks returning to all these waters. I don't think we'll ever start hunting the humpback whales in a large manner again. I think they're just too beloved and too many people care about them. And I think there's many other concerns, um, climate change, ocean acidification, pollution, acoustic sounds bothering them. Um, there's many, many concerns, but I don't think the harpoon is one of them. The complexity of whale song is an exquisite example of how nature and evolution have shaped living things to exist in balance with their environment. It took millions of years to create this balance, so more than ever, it's vital that we do everything we can to protect the living heritage of our planet, so that whale song can go on delighting our children and our children's children.